host of Guild Night, Undercroft CEO Adam Wooden Sheffield. Welcome, welcome, everybody. I hope everybody's having a good evening here on September 10th. Um, starting to feel like fall, not weather-wise. Um, we just had a big thunderstorm roll through. And John, were you going over the Howard Franklin or the Gandhi to get here? I had a Gandhi because it was an accident. Yep, yep. I had to deal with that this morning as well. Uh, still rainy season. Starting to feel like fall primarily because apparently football's back tonight. Um, I know we have a, a, a guild... Uh, fantasy football team going on um i will lose because i auto drafted uh as trey so aptly mentioned but uh it's hard to feel like fall and people are starting to come back to the undercroft we've got uh i think we got eight folks here in studio tonight uh we got about another three or four up front uh uh working on some other projects and uh, a couple of residents uh here as well working on some other things so uh it's starting to feel like normal again um ebor city's starting to bustle again I got attacked by a chicken when I went to get uh, a slice of pizza today at New York, New York. Um, yeah, they hide in the bushes. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> anyway, we're looking forward to seeing more folks out at uh, um, out at Fob Undercroft here, uh, in particular. Uh, as usual, guild announcements. So we mentioned last week guild elections will take place on October fifteenth, not September fifteenth, Trey. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> COVID's got everybody messed up. Um, we will have those standards out here shortly. So there will be a nomination process um, for that and then a rubric uh, around, you know, how we're going to go about conducting these elections, specifically looking at um, the following factors, as I mentioned last week, which is integrity, engagement, and uh, expertise. Programming. Uh, Calendar continues to fill up. We've got uh, next week for Guild Night, the introduction to reverse engineering, the first part of a multi-part series with Dr. Bill Gauvin. We have Mike Jenke, founder of Silent Circle and Black Phone and co-founder of Data Tribe, uh, will be speaking to us on uh, the 24th of September. We also have Guild member Tracy um, has a couple events. I believe it's next Wednesday and the Wednesday after that associated with... Um, was it Hacktoberfest? Something along those lines. It'll be good. It's going to be a, a, a lot of stuff around uh, GitHub, GitLab, and uh, open source software. Uh, so definitely uh, tune in or show up for that. We'll have that posted on the calendar here shortly. October, um, we've got, I can't announce it yet, but we've got some pretty cool stuff coming up with our first Hack uh, UC, Hack the Undercroft. Um, was working with one of our uh, fellow members on that today. It's going to be a fun event. And uh, we got another talk coming up on asymmetric, asymmetric crypto um, in, October, in October as well. As always, our website programming calendar is the go-to place for what's going on out here. Um, that's your primary point of uh, information. New members, I mentioned last time we got a new system going in place. I'm not going to be announcing new members until after October 1st. But I will say here today we have two prospective new members in the audience. Um, Lizette being one, and uh, Richard being another, uh, as well as Cadian, who was here earlier today. Unfortunately, she couldn't stick around for the stream. Uh, but uh, if you're here on site, uh, definitely make sure you uh, reach out, uh, introduce yourself, greet them. Uh, otherwise, we look forward to introducing you on Slack, um, hopefully, when they join the organization here or join the club. Um, what else we got here? Development Center announcements. Uh, I believe Chris pushed it out on Slack today. Uh, it wasn't in the general channel, but I'll have to repost that. But uh, we have a new partnership with an organization called Applied Technology Academy, where we have negotiated a 20% discount for guild members that are interested in pursuing certain certifications, uh, whether that's Network Plus, Security Plus. Uh, we're piloting the Network Plus class starting September 28th. So if you are a guild member interested in getting that uh, certification or going through that course, uh, reach out to us. Um, another benefit of being a guild member, we're going to bring in some awesome training um, and make it cheap, but good. <laughs> uh, if you have an internship or practicum requirement or interest in putting in some time at UC, email me directly. Um, 
COVID update, don't be stupid. Masks on site, hand sanitizer on site. If you're sick, stay home. Um, we got this. All right. On to the uh, peace state resistance, as they say. We've got uh, Senior John Singer in the house. Haven't seen this guy in a few months. It's good to see you out again. And uh, being the radio nerd that I am, I'm interested in this talk because I'm going to be going home tonight and over this weekend. I'm going to be doing this freaking. I'm going to be rewatching this so I can get this shit going up with that Labus Raspberry Pi I got at home right now. Sounds like a, a sleepless night and weekend ahead for you. Yeah, my wife's going to hate me. I might be divorced by next Monday. No. Um, sorry, Monica. Uh, uh, for those of you that don't know John, he's one of our original Undercroft masters. Uh, you may know him from such talks last year as Splunk for the Enterprise. That was a good one. Um, also helped us bring in that great event from Splunk with uh, Weld Pond uh, as well. And uh, really, he's a Splunk guru and a uh, um, founder of Hack at UCF. Uh, they win CCD. Did they win CCDC this last time? No, Again? This last. Okay, so they got out their game a little bit. They always make it fun. There we go. <laughs> uh, anyway, he's an all-around cool dude. Um, this is an awesome talk. I think the way we came up with this talk is I was texting you or slacking you that I had an S or a Raspberry Pi, and, and I didn't know what the heck to do with it. What, what should I do with this thing? Yeah. I, I, you told me to build a Nintendo. I already built it. Like, yep. what, what do I do next? <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to be an awesome talk, y'all. Uh, without any uh, further uh, ado, Chris, you want to roll the intro? Welcome to building an SDR base station with a Raspberry Pi with Undercroft Guild Master John Singer. Cool. All right. Yep. Ready to go? Yeah, we're ready. Awesome. Hey, everybody tuning in online. Um, welcome to this evening's uh, Guild Talk. This is SDR Base Stations with Raspberry Pis. Um, I chose this really cool picture to start out with because there's a lot you can really get into on this topic. Um, a lot more than we're going to be able to cover in the next hour or so. So I hope this inspires you to, you know, go home where you're already at um, and build some really cool stuff. Uh, not everything we're going to talk about here is going to cost a fortune. Prices have come way down. Um, most of the stuff we're going to talk about is stuff you can do without a ham license. So you're going to be able to start, you know, with these projects immediately. And we're going to have a good time. So we'll cover some really cool stuff today. So. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. My name is Jonathan Singer. Uh, our topics we'll cover today is a little bit about who am I, right? Uh, some of you may have seen me or met me before. Uh, hello. But if you haven't, I'll uh, introduce myself. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the basics uh, and history of radio. Now, I'm not going to get into this too deep because there's an entire you know, level of, of education and communications that uh, much much more people out there are, are better at it than I am. Uh, so I just want to kind of really quickly discuss the basics, just to just get a level playing field for everybody uh, as we go through some of the different topics to make sense of what we're talking about. Next, we'll talk about what is an SDR, right? We, we, we opened up with SDR base stations, Raspberry Pis, but what exactly is an SDR? Next, we'll kind of float over to some of this radio hardware and software. Uh, the basic components that we'll share and show today that can help you get started with your projects. Our first project we'll discuss is one uh, called The Freak Show. We'll get into what that means in a little bit if you can guess. Uh, the second project is an ADSB or a, what we call next gen in the aviation industry. Uh, we'll see what that actually means. Uh, planes are interesting. Our third project we'll cover is, uh, is APRS. And, for those that have their ham radio license, you may already be aware of what APRS is, but if you're not, think of it as almost like, a, like an 
offline airwave online communication system. Uh, it's really cool and you can get involved with a Raspberry Pi. It's kind of that simple. Uh, we'll cover my favorite topics, which is legalities. Uh, and then finally, where you can seek out extra information next, right? After this talk, some of the places that I consider wonderful wealths and sources of information. And then we'll get to some questions, uh, including our online viewers. So, who am I? Uh, that's me in a photo shoot. I did things once with a suit. But now uh, I have my master's in the cybers from locally here at USF. Uh, and I did my undergrad in uh, Orlando at UCF. But uh, some fun things, I am a goon at DEF CON, so if you see me wearing a red shirt running around the hallways in Las Vegas yelling at you, it's purely out of love, uh, and also so that you don't get hurt. Um, here in Tampa, we have a local OWASP chapter. Uh, I run uh, this with a wonderful team uh, of individuals, and we all put in a ton of effort to make a really awesome, successful community there. Uh, B-Sides Orlando is one of the, the things back when I was living in Orlando that I was heavily involved with, still to this day a little bit, um, but, uh, but we're coming up on our eighth year, I believe, now. Uh, so look out for that. Uh, it'll be online uh, within the next couple of months. Uh, as mentioned, yeah, I do Splunk. I do it for a company called GuidePoint Security, and I have a great time doing it. I've been doing it for quite a few years now. Um, and. Uh, look up some of my uh, older talks if you've been in the area and come by them. If not, feel free to reach out to me on, um, you know, on the guild member Slack uh, once, you're, once you're in. Uh, I have certs. I don't care to list them. I just got a lot of, a lot of certs, a lot of letters. They're cool. They're fun. Not to, not to really say certs aren't bad, but and you start to get people with a lot of letters. And, of course, an undercroft guild master. So thank you for that. Let's begin with a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, again, foundational. Uh, we all need to learn where we came from. So what does that mean? Let's talk about a couple basic principles here. Right? We got receiving and we got transmitting. So receiving, or Rx, is listening. Right? That's where you can passively exist. Think of it like sitting in a coffee shop, which you can't really do these days. but the idea is, is you can hear everything going on around you. And as long as you're not saying anything, you're listening. You're receiving data. So Rx is the kind of vernacular for receiving. Okay? And for the most part, what we'll talk about today is receiving because these things exist already in the air around us. We can receive all kinds of signals uh, simply by putting up our antenna and just seeing what's there. Now, TX, or transmitting, right? That's the, that's the act of sending. That's the act of reciprocating. Um, and that's adding to those airwaves. Now, uh, this, this active you know, transmission, that's where things get a little bit uh, iffy. Okay? And that's where we start to walk a really fine line on maybe what's legal or simply just may require a ham license, right? And so you may just need to be properly authorized to perform radio transmissions. But for now, for the most part, you can receive. Um, and that's, that's pretty OK. And so I have this little illustration here to, to kind of you know, show. We control from one end, which is our transmitter, right? We're sending things versus our receiver, which is going to be that other end. So maybe that, that controller, maybe it's like an RC car. And so one is clearly going to be receiving, one's clearly going to be transmitting. And so um, that's just to kind of lay down some nice groundwork. Our next um, is the illustration on the left. And what we see here is this involves the moving of the amplitude, so the intensity, the vertical, the up and down of our signal, right, of the carrier wave. Whereas FM, right, the frequency modulation or the frequency changing is going to be the uh, width between each of these waves. And you can see from the illustration, um, you know, our AM signal at the bottom is going to have, uh, you know, peaks that are going to have highs and lows that are coming from our information signal. Whereas with FM, we're, our, um, you know, that peak is going to remain consistent. 
but our frequency is going to shift and change. And again, there is all kinds of deep dives that we can really go down with this stuff, and that's not for what, that's not what today is about. You know, you'll learn a lot of this if you get into ham license training, uh, if you have a military background in comms, things like that cover a lot of these uh, basics. Um, and also, you know, uh, lots of college classes cover this. And again, we're not getting into it. I just want to make sure we have a basic understanding of receiving and transmitting and the difference between amplitude and frequency modulation. So that's basically it as far as the groundwork. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's, uh, let's get into what we're talking about today. So these SDRs, and it's that software-defined radio, right? And so a software-defined radio is defined simply as a radio communication system where the components have been traditionally implemented in hardware, we'll figure out what that means in a second, are instead implemented by means um, of software on a computer or embedded system. And so what exactly are we saying here? We're saying that radios uh, traditionally take in a signal and do all of the manipulation and all the filtering and amplification and modulation and do all these different things within the device itself. Right, so it's a very confined, purpose-built unit. And this is how it has been for years. Right? Think of a standard radio that you listen to music on. That piece of hardware does one thing really well because it's a purpose-built device. At the beginning, we're receiving that signal in from our antenna. But what happens is then the signal is then manipulated and modified accordingly to serve. Right? Now, software-defined radio abstracts a lot of that filtering and you know, modulation and splitting of all this different stuff, and it, puts that, it offloads that to a computer. Well, what does that allow us to do if we offload a previously hardwired system? Can anybody guess? More mobile. More mobile, yeah. But it allows us to, well, yeah, money, right? Hardware costs money. But it allows us to be dynamic with it. It allows us to change, right? So no longer we're dealing with a purpose-built piece of hardware where the signal ends at the hardware very quickly and then all of the, the fancy stuff, right, all of the math happens on the computer. And if I want to change the purpose, I can do it on the computer dynamically in software. So suddenly that radio seems super archaic if it can only do one thing. I wish it could do 10 things. Right? So if we take it all the way back to where the signal initially comes in and we use um, something like uh, an analog to digital converter, now suddenly we put all that responsibility in software. And so that's what we've done here is we've taken predefined functionality and allowed it to be a lot more dynamic. So let's talk about the history of the software-defined radio and even just the concept of hooking up a piece of equipment to a computer. So the first digital receiver, right, this term was coined back in the 70s by researchers um, at the Department of Defense. There was an effort to figure out how to make something a little bit more useful, right? When you build it once as this hardware, you have to build an entirely separate device to do a completely different function. Then this, this concept of a software radio this was introduced uh, back in 84 by, um, by E-Systems, which has since been acquired by Raytheon, defense contractor. Um, but what they did is they really took off with applying uh, an input of hardware into a computer. And they really they de designed software around this. And they, they really started to, to pioneer the, the concept that we were starting to see. Um, this research uh, led directly into an article being published in IEEE, uh, a very prestigious engineering journal, um, back in 92, to, to really show what's capable with this new concept, this revolutionary idea of, of working with computers and uh, signal and radio data. And then finally, the software-defined radio that we pretty much know it as today, um, was, was finally coined in 95, um, and that actually came also similarly from a military effort, right? And so we can see there's a long history of comms, 
and military ties, and we can start to piece together the puzzle of, of what was going on, you know, back in the day. And what it was, it was called the Speakeasy program, right? And, and this has actually grown a lot. There's a Speakeasy 2 and, and things like that. But it was the first public, right, software-defined radio initiative, uh, and this was DARPA Air Force, right? And so DARPA is one of the great agencies that brought us, you know, uh, paid self-driving cars way before Tesla was doing it and way before it was cool. Um, and so they had a military project called Speakeasy. Right? And so the goal of Speakeasy was to make uh, these military radios programmable because if they needed to change the purpose of them dynamically, quickly, right? And they needed to operate on different frequencies very quickly and do all kinds of different things in the field, right? Like imagine if you're doing something in the military and you discover that your enemy is using an entirely different set of technology. That means you have to go all the way back to the drawing board to rebuild a new piece of hardware, right? Well, if you have software-defined radio, you can quickly adapt to what how to how they're transmitting, what frequencies they're transmitting on, what filters and methods and modulations they're using. We can do this all very quickly to be able to listen in on their signal. Okay? And the goal, right, and I mentioned this, was to easily incorporate new coding and modulation standards in the future so we can, you know, try to keep up with what was going on with all these other, you know, adversaries and other communication methods. And so, like all good fun things like Tor, uh, our government kind of brought us to these wonderful toys we're at today through their military research and grants. So, it's a little bit of background. Um, and we've come a long way since 1995. We really have. Uh, you know, a lot of this equipment, uh, as, as cool as it sounds, was still revolutionary at the time. It was very expensive. It was very lab. It was very research. It was very, you know... Um, it was just it was a whole new concept at the time. If anybody can remember, like you know, computers used to be really expensive, and now they're moderately cheap. And, and the same thing when, when we're talking back in the day, this is a new concept in technology. Things were very expensive, and it wasn't your average consumer or even most commercial uh, people were using this or even knew about it. So let's take a look at modern day SDR hardware, right? And again, I mentioned this earlier, that analog to digital converter. We're taking stuff right out of the airwaves and we're converting it to a digital signal that our computers can process and work with. So the first one, uh, this is one of my favorite, one of the, the, the better known, a little bit more powerful components out there. Um, this one's called the HackRF1. And uh, in a second, we'll get over there. Um, so what's interesting about this is it's called a half duplex transceiver. And so we talked about receivers and transmitters. So transceivers, a little bit of both right in the middle. And it can only send or receive. But what it can do is it can send, but it is capable of both. Uh, it operates from one megahertz to six gigahertz, right? And there's a myriad, I mean, a ton of really cool things in that frequency range. You can go on the FCC's website and take a look at what is registered across all of these different spectrums. And so you can get an idea of what's capable. I mean, Wi-Fi runs on 2.4, Bluetooth runs on 2.4 gigs. Um, so that's right there in the middle. Cellular, right, is around 900, 800 megahertz and upwards. That's in that range, okay? Uh, all kinds of remote control devices like your garage door opener. Uh, you, you can just let your imagination go from there. Um, it does 2 million samples per second. So imagine it's constantly sniffing the airwaves, right? And again, this is software configurable to do both receiving uh, and transmitting. And also it has some built-in filters to help you get some of that offloaded you know, data. One of the cool things is that you can actually hook up a powered antenna to this too. Um, again, you know, another rabbit hole, but the idea is sometimes antennas can be amplified with a little bit of juice, uh, and this also supports powered antennas. At the end of the day, the whole thing runs on USB. That means you can hook it up to your computer. It's a very powerful tool. It's open source hardware. Uh, so the whole thing is online, the code, the hardware, the chips, everything about it. Uh, and the best part is it's a $333 uh, unit that is extremely dangerous and extremely powerful. Um, or you can go online and get a clone. Because it is open source, 
other people simply just took the hardware designs, manufactured it themselves, uh, and are selling it just as much. So uh, you pick and choose. So our first uh, visual demo for today is I wanted to give an honorable mention to this little device over here. So what I have here is a portable HackRF with what's called a porta pack. And a porta pack uh, inside this case is a HackRF, is a battery pack. And then shielded on top of the device is a jog wheel to navigate and a full color touch screen. And so these porta packs are very handy to take your HackRF, which can not just re uh, receive but also transmit and take it with you on the road or wherever you're going. And so right now I don't have it doing anything, um, but it is very capable in many ways. And so you can pick up a lot of this hardware online. Uh, Great Scott Gadgets is the one who originally designed the HackRF one, but I mentioned uh, that you can also get some of this stuff um, overseas, uh, reputable clones uh, just as much. So. We'll bring the camera back over here. And by the way, if anybody uh, wants to mess with it after, uh, you're more than welcome to. Uh, just bring your uh, Lysol wipes. Uh, and I don't know, do we have those? I got to yeah. say it. Yeah, yeah cool. So, uh, but I did want to do an honorable mention, uh, mostly because this is truly a software-defined radio, uh, but it's not a computer in the sense of like a Raspberry Pi uh, or your desktop or laptop, uh, but it is still running code. Uh, it's still open source. And I thought it was just really cool and I wanted to at least share uh, some of the different options that are out there. It's got a headphone jack to listen to any kind of audio that is being um, received out of the airwaves. So like think like FM radio. Um, my particular model has a battery built in, not all of them do, so it's ultra portable. Um, and a ton of features, uh, all the bells and whistles you could ever want and imagine. So uh, if you have any questions about it, please uh, let me know and I will point you in the right direction of how to acquire one of these wonderful borderline tools. What's the question? It is rechargeable. Yep, it is a LiPo battery built in. In fact, I have it on the charger right now, but I can unplug it and it will continue uh, operating. Uh, you know, I haven't figured that out yet. Um, I've had no issues uh, with battery life, uh, but I also don't test its limits. It's got a built in uh, 1000 milliamp hour uh, battery. So, uh, but that's this particular one. So, uh, anyways, check it out. Uh, next really cool piece of hardware I wanted to mention, this is called the Lime SDR. All right, and if you thought a HackRF1 with the capabilities of receiving and transmitting um, were cool, these Lime SDRs are nuts. They're full duplex. That means we can send and receive at the same time, not just one or the other. Um, and that gives us interesting capabilities that, uh, that, that kind of that half uh, doesn't get. Um, it operates from 100 kilohertz, so very low frequency, to 3.8 gigahertz. Still covers most of the things we would want to pick up uh, today. Really beyond that, there isn't too much once you get into that high spectrum range. And I uh, just listed a couple examples here, but one of the ones that I really wanted to point out that the Lime SDR can do with full duplex is we can do stuff like cellular base stations. A Lime SDR is capable of setting up an LTE tower all in this little guy right here. Obviously, you need amplification, but from a software perspective and a baseline hardware perspective, this is capable of building your own cell phone network. Pretty cool. Uh, and at the lonely little price of also about $300, you can be just as dangerous. Um, it's really interesting what, uh, what the hardware market today is capable of with just the cost of chips and manufacturing um, overseas has just really driven down the capabilities of a lot of this stuff. Now, the Lime SDR is not open source like the HackRF one, so you won't necessarily see clones of it. Uh, you can really only get it from authorized distributors, uh, so there isn't like a cheaper alternative. But, uh, but if you're really into this stuff, uh, it's definitely worth the investment. And honestly, it kind of just goes up from here. There's even more crazier devices that have just have more inputs and outputs and have more frequency range capabilities. Um, and that's, 
that's a whole other thing that, that we're no longer being a hobbyist, I would say, at that point. And, uh, and so let's keep this a hobby. Let's keep it fun. Let's keep it safe, right? <laughs> totally. <laughs> so um, let's get to what we really came here for, the SDR, but not just any SDR, the RTL SDR. RTL? What the hell was RTL make special? Well, it's the Realtek RTL. Uh, in fact, it comes from the chip, the name of the microchip that's the primary you know, component of these little USB sticks. Now, compared to the previous two, this is much smaller. In fact, I uh, have one right here. I'll bring it on camera. Uh, this is it, really. It's, uh, it's, it's this big, tiny little thing. Um, no, it's, it's about the size of a thumb drive, and uh, that's basically it. And jam-packed in this little device is everything you need to get started with scanning and surfing the airwaves, okay? And so this Realtek chip uh, was originally used uh, for people to listen to radio and watch TV on their laptops. And that's what it was for a long time. In fact, um, some of this, these original ones, this one I have here is DVB-T plus DAB plus FM. So they're digital video uh, tuners to pick up analog TV and, and, and radio on your laptop. Um, so that's what they originally kind of were out there for. And it was discovered that, uh, you know, the tuning was being done by software. Oh, well, that, that, that kind of, you know, turned on a light and said, well, wait a minute, the software controls the full functionality of this device? And, and, and all of the, all of like the TV part and the radio part is done on the computer and it's not done on the device. Well, can I reprogram it for another purpose, right? This different type of modulation and filtering and other needs? Absolutely. So this is the new standard. Uh, there's a lot of reasons it's the new standard. It's cheap. I mean, uh, the one I have uh, here, the RTL SDR, the branded one from the, from the RTL SDR community, uh, that's only, you know, $20, $25. You can get these things for a couple bucks overseas, really. Uh, now, obviously, these, these more expensive models, they're going to have higher uh, quality components. They're going to have uh, better oscillators inside, which is very important, right? Everything's built on a frequency. And as we can, you know, focus in on that frequency, that's the goal. So they, they've, they're just better overall when it comes to more accurate in their capabilities and measurement. But at the end of the day, same purpose. Uh, 24 megahertz to 1.7 gigahertz range, and still that covers a ton of things. Uh, there's all kinds of devices that are operating in the 315 megahertz range, the 433 megahertz range, the 900 megahertz range, the 800 megahertz range. This is still a great budget tool, and I have a bunch of them. In fact, I have three myself. Uh, two of these uh, cheapy uh, TV radio ones, but I do actually have one of the branded ones that you see here on this slide. Now, unlike the previous two that are totally dangerous, this is receive only, right? These aren't transmitting. Um, you know, there's people out there that can get into the hardware and mod it, but we're, we want to listen. We want to see what's out there. We want to see what we can do with that wonderful data. And so I highly suggest these things. They're, they're fun. They're cheap. They're very readily available on Amazon. Um, and it's, it's just this is a great starting platform for anybody who wants to get into SDR and learn and experiment. Um, and so uh, you know, this, this is definitely the, the starting point for everybody's adventure. Uh, and I just really want to remind everybody online, we do uh, listen to you. And if you have any questions at any time, you know, please feel free to chime in. I've got a couple. Oh, you do? Have yeah. Oh, please. I'd love, to, I'd love yeah. to hear the questions online. Just, just throw them up. Yeah, so uh, this one's from RJ45. Oh, hey, RJ. Uh, he up? says, uh, what's the appeal use case examples of the hacker RF1? Um, cool. So... The, the, the use case and the appeal of this is the fact that it can transmit. So uh, that's going to be the first one. But, but basically, it also just has a very wide 
uh, capability of frequencies that it can pick up. It, its spectrum is massive, up to six gigahertz. Um, and most devices on the market today do not go that far. So if you are targeting something in the, in the higher frequency range, or if you do require uh, potential transmission, uh, the Hacker F1 uh, will help cover all of those needs. So hope that answers your question. Um, and then I've got one from Glenn. Um, what's better now than in 1995 besides the uh, Fios? Um, the software yeah. has changed a lot. The hardware has grown and become more accurate. It's also that it's uh, achievable by the average consumer. So again, I, we're talking you know, just a couple bucks now for the, the cheap EE overseas clones. Uh, this stuff was thousands, if not tens of thousands, about hundreds of thousands of dollars back in the day. And so the difference between 95 and now is that you can too. Uh, back then, uh, you had to be military grade, defense contractor, research lab, university, you know, to achieve uh, just some of the basic capabilities of what um, you know, uh, a, a child can, can code overnight now with these things. So uh, we've, just, we've just advanced a lot uh, in a long way, and I can't wait to see what comes next. And then, uh, not really a question, but uh, Vodka Not says every time you speak, his bank account gets smaller. Every time, you yeah. know, <laughs> um, he should set up uh, some kind of like crowdfunding, source funding for that because I can't control his spending, uh, but uh, what I can control is his imagination, and I'm going to send it to the moon. There you go. <laughs> so, awesome. Well, thanks for that. Um, it gets better. Uh, so, this right here is a really cool project. Uh, they took four RTL SDRs and shoved them in a case. And that allows for very interesting things to happen that allows you to take multiple SDRs and do comparisons with each other and overlap them and make it even more powerful. And so suddenly you have all this extra functionality added when you start to layer these pieces of hardware. Uh, you can do direction finding. So one of the cool things um, is, is to, so take a look at this. You have an antenna, uh, north, south, east, and west. And then you have a signal. And you can measure the strength at each antenna to determine which direction the source is coming from. This is really cool. I mean, modern methods for cell phone tracking is triangulation, strength between three or more towers. Well, we now have the capability to do our own triangulation or quadrilation. I don't know whatever the word is called for four, but uh, but this there, you are now simply capable of measuring signal strength from a source and then determining the approximate direction uh, in which the origin of that source is. Like this is extremely useful for people that uh, may be lost right in the desert uh, or in a jungle, and and they have some kind of radio equipment on them. Right? Or this may be useful for tracking down uh, people, uh, uh, criminals that are actively uh, using radio technology to transmit uh, in, a, in a legal manner. Right? So it's really interesting we can do for this. Passive radar and beam forming are just a couple of the other things. And again, super rabbit hole there, but I'll let you, I'll let you Google that one. Uh, but when you bring together and when you make four RTL SDRs coherent with each other, uh, it's just it's extremely interesting what's capable. And what I really like most about this piece of hardware is not just a lot of that functionality and feature set, but it has a Raspberry Pi header right on top of it. It's asking to be hooked up to a Raspberry Pi. It wants to be part of your toys and do cool things, right? So give your Raspberry Pi a home right on top of the Kerberos. It's right there. Um, but anyways, check these things out. These are also a little on the pricey side. Very purpose-built, you know, if you're into this stuff, great, but it is still a hobbyist and consumer grade. So. Do you have the port pack for that? Uh, no. So the port pack is a purpose-built shield for the Hacker F1, and it matches a, an interface. Okay. Uh, it, it's just a pin-to-pin -pin match. Um, and the Hacker F1 came first as a, as a universal piece of hardware. The port pack was a shield that was added on top of it to make it a standalone device uh, independent of a computer. So, um, so you must be asking yourself, stop teasing me with all these things and draining my bank account. What can I do with these things? What am I, why am I here in the first place? That's a lot. I don't expect you to read all these. 
Uh, it's a big list. In fact, it probably looks really small on a stream too. Uh, but I highlighted a couple of fun things that I thought would pique everybody's interest. Uh, the first one I highlighted was tracking aircraft without a radar system using planes own communication. Super cool. All right. Decoding Poxag and flex pager traffic. Did you know we still have pagers today? And I'm not talking like cool and retro, like, yo, check out my pager. I mean, like, actually, you know, hospitals and emergency services actively use pagers today. Um, they're extremely reliable. And, uh, and, and, and they get the point across, right, very quickly and very effectively. Uh, and they don't really break down like we have cell phones crashing and iOS and Android security vulnerabilities and updates. Uh, it's, it's a standard, a very standardized system that's just extremely robust. And so we still use them today. Uh, and we can listen to them. It's also floating in the airwaves. Um, sniffing GSM signals. This is fun, right? Yeah, cell phones. Cool. Dangerous. Please be careful. Um, listening to FM radio and decoding RDS information. Uh, going back to the roots of this stuff, right? Well, some of this hardware was originally designed just to listen to the radio on the computer because at, maybe at the time just something wasn't available or you wanted to record the radio, right? So a lot of you know, basic, really cool basic stuff. I highlighted the receiving uh, <laughs> NOAA weather satellite images, right? Oh, that's really cool. We'll, we'll, get into what, we'll get into a lot of these examples. Um, the last one I highlighted was listening to the International Space Station. I think that's awesome. As, as like a huge nerd, um, the fact that we already know it's floating overhead, right, in, in suspended orbit, but it's actively communicating back with Earth. I mean, we got that. They have internet in the space station. But did you know that the space station is actively broadcasting all kinds of great information that you can listen in on for fun publicly? It's, it's super, what was that? Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll play. We'll play with it in a second. Okay. So just a couple, a couple uh, things you can do once you really start to get into software-defined radio. So we covered the hardware. Uh, real quickly, we'll talk about some of the software uh, because a lot of this stuff still pertains to the desktop, laptop, PC world. Right? But today we really want to talk about Raspberry Pis. But at least I'll give you a little taste of what you can do in, on your computers in the meantime. And so there's some really good tools out there, Windows, Linux, Mac, stuff like that. Uh, GNU Radio, GNU Radio, is, uh, is like the super nerd version. Uh, and I mean that in the kindest way because it's extremely manual, extremely verbose, right? And when we talked about the, that hardware process initially being abstracted from the predefined device and bringing that into the computer to do all the math and the calculations and the filtering, um, GNU Radio is the kind of place that you would achieve that because you can manually rebuild that hardware data process from start to finish, splitting signals, bringing them back together, amplification, all kinds of stuff. Um, and so it's a really cool tool and so you can, you can get all kinds of pre-built templates for different purposes or you can build your own. This is the, like, this is the, the communication you know, person's dream. This stuff is intense. Um, uh, by the way, I will be sharing these slides, so they will be made available online. Uh, and that's to you online, too. So uh, look out for the, the information when I share them. Uh, GQRX, this is what I currently use on my Mac. Uh, I plug in a USB uh, RTL SDR, fire up GQRX, and I get all kinds of great uh, spectrum analysis here. I can tune it. I can change some of the different functionality. I can look at it from different perspectives. I get waterfall views, so I can see signal strength. Just really cool stuff. And again, it's on a multitude of platforms. Um, SDR Sharp. This one is for Windows, if you can imagine Sharp, C Sharp, right? Okay, so Microsoft. Um, but it's a super powerful Windows tool. I highly suggest it if you're in a Windows environment. It's a fantastic tool set. It has a ton of modular capability and plugins. Uh, it's been around for a long time, very versatile. Um, and a lot of the, the really cool functionality you saw on the previous slide uh, can be done with SDR Sharp because of its, its wide variety of capabilities. And then there was another piece of hardware I didn't really mention. I thought about it, but we talked a lot about hardware and I didn't want to make your bank cry anymore. Um, but SDR Uno is another wonderful piece of software uh, from the SDR Play team. And SDR Play is another uh, one of these boxes that you know hooks up in USB and does all this wonderful, sweet magic that makes you the, the commander of the airwaves. 
So uh, let's jump into uh, the first uh, hardware project that you can build yourself. And I kind of hinted at this earlier. Uh, we're going to call it the Freak Show. Well, I didn't call it that. Uh, the developers called it that. Uh, it's um, it's going to be fun. So we'll bring on the Freak Show. What this is is a Raspberry Pi um, spectrum analyzer, scanner, device, visual. Um, and so this, this frequency analyzer pairs a Raspberry Pi uh, with a uh, touchscreen. So you get a, a visual, so it's all in one cube unit, right? And you run the standard Raspberry Pi OS, or Raspbian as it used to be called, right? And pretty simple. And it supports um, any of the RTL SDR hardware that is uh, pick up uh, that works with the standard library. So whether it's that, that special silver one directly from RTL SDR you know, website, or the little cheapo you know, import radio ones, uh, supports all of them. Uh, and, and when you make it uh, portable with a battery pack, you are really, really making this thing fun. So you have the capability of having your own spectrum analyzer in the palm of your hands. And so um, we'll, we'll real quickly uh, take a look at what some of this hardware looks like. And so I, I brought one with me today. Um, and so over here on the table, as we bring the camera, uh, this is the device right here. And so I actively have it on. Uh, listening, and so this is SCR, and you can see it's running entirely off of a battery pack. And so in the case is the Raspberry Pi, and the touchscreen's on top. I have my RTL SCR hooked up here to my external antenna, and this antenna is not tuned for any particular frequency. And by the way, that's a thing that that antennas are designed to match the the frequency that you're trying to pick up. In fact, the height uh, matters in that case. But again. A whole other theory we're not going to get into. And so uh, this device is a touchscreen, and so I can get here and I can change the frequency that I want to listen on. I can change all kinds of different sensitivities. And right now I actually have it tuned to 103.5 because that's a radio station in the area. And so it gives us a very good clear signal here. And I have it in waterfall mode, but I can change it over to our frequency analysis mode, and we can see the spikes in our area that we're currently tuned to. So things are really cool. Um, and it's a wonderful little portable device. Uh, this one's built on a Raspberry Pi 4, but the documentation uh, makes it, uh, it was originally designed for the original Raspberry Pi 1 when that first came out. And so you're not limited to any particular level of hardware. It doesn't take a lot to achieve this. All right, so we'll head back over to the little talking station. Um, and so, so that, that's, that's a freak show, right? And so what does it take to uh, ultimately build one of these things, right, for yourself? And so let's take a look at the assembly process. And so what we have here is we have uh, a cheap pie case, really it's just plastic, picked it up on, on Amazon, uh, and, it, and it came with the touchscreen. So it's, it's more or less a case with a touchscreen that connects right to the GPIO header all in one, makes it super easy. Okay, uh, and an SDR. And really, that's all that you need to achieve this goal. And so uh, the antenna uh, that comes with it, for the most part, is just fine, right? How are we doing? Good. Okay. Uh, and, um, but if you want to get a more tuned uh, antenna, if you're looking for a very specific task, uh, be my guest. Uh, the, the one I'm using has a, what's called an SMA connector on it, and it allows you to simply uh, just screw on all kinds of other antennas. I brought a couple uh, as an example. Uh, and then I prefer the stylus because uh, uh, I'm really weird about getting touchscreens dirty, but also it's a little bit uh, better with the accuracy, although it is a fairly big screen with big buttons as for what we're trying to do. Uh, so, uh, but that's really it. Uh, you can get this stuff on Amazon, uh, dirt cheap. It really only is a, a combination of a, a touchscreen case kit an RTL SDR, and a Raspberry Pi. Obviously, I don't need to tell you that a Raspberry Pi needs a memory card uh, and a power source, but I'll leave that up to you for the purpose of this. Hope this is one of the, the simpler, easier projects to, to build. And so to set this thing up, we install our, our Raspberry Pi operating system, right? Very simple. We install our screen drivers. Uh, wherever you bought it from, they'll have instructions for setting up your screen. 
Um, mine uh, was very simple, and it just ran a script, and then boom, everything was working. Um, and then we installed the software. And so this, come, this is uh, initially developed by Adafruit. Uh, if everybody's familiar with Adafruit, it's a wonderful hardware uh, manufacturer and reseller. Has all kinds of great stuff on their website uh, and just wonderful documentation, um, videos, and they support the community. Uh, so check them out. And so they initially built the Freak Show project. Uh, and then at the end, you just run the Python script, run Freak Show. I actually set it up so that uh, on boot up, it automatically runs it. So as soon as I power the device on, it boots into the OS and then goes straight to Freak Show. So I don't really have to do anything. It's up and running uh, in it, on its own within seconds. And so that's, that's the optional step is to, to make it start up automatically. And so you can see here on the screen, now I'm featuring a couple of settings. And so we can see the, the frequencies that you have it tuned to, right? The intensities of the signal and how big those, those you know, jumps are going to be um, for the amplitude and all kinds of different things. Uh, you can, again, set up your, your center frequency or where you're initially tuned to so you can see around it. With a, with a nice narrow bandwidth sampling rate terminology I'm still working on. Um, but it's a lot of fun. It's super cool. Uh, and um, it's, it's a great first project. Uh, and in the meantime, you get yourself a nice touch screen. The whole thing, at the end of the day, uh, I think I spent uh, just shy of 70 bucks on everything. Um, uh, super cheap SDR, touch screen kit, and then uh, any Raspberry Pi will do. So uh, definitely uh, check it out. And so that is your first project with your uh, SDR base station. Uh, something cool I really wanted to mention was a lot of these uh, tools, right? a lot of software um, and Raspberry Pis were kind of made for each other, right? Like this was, this was developed by Adafruit. You know, they thought the marriage of the touchscreen and the SDR and the Pi was cool, and I think it is too. Um, but there has been a, a community that has made an SDR-focused Pi image, right? This image is an all-in-one, so we don't even have to now just install uh, components and, and in different pieces at a time. Uh, we can install this one image, and it has a ton of uh, supported software already built in. And so some of these things are that, that uh, GNU radio. It is already built into this uh, SDR Pi image. There's that GQRX I talked about. There's some of the Lime stuff. If you have a Lime SDR, the, the software is already there, right? Uh, and then all kinds of additional tools, right? Multimon, that's a crazy thing with taking the data and all kinds of fun stuff. So if you're really into taking your Raspberry Pi and doing all kinds of interesting SDR uh, you know, functionality and data and different hardware and different SDRs that you've purchased over time. Check out this OS. Um, again, it's purpose built. It supports, uh, you know, uh, the variety of Raspberry Pi devices out there. Okay, so the next one we're going to jump to is uh, my personal, I'm, I don't want to say favorite, but it's my longest running Pi that I've ever owned. And I'll, I'll explain why. And so our second project is, uh, is plane spotting for the rest of us. Uh, and I know, it sounds crazy. In fact, I chose this background of like an air traffic control center um, to, to kind of hint at where we're going with this. So at my house and at many homes and offices and places and Dharma's house across the world, uh, People run uh, SDRs monitoring airplane traffic. This is actually a screenshot um, taken uh, about a month ago when I was starting to put these slides together uh, from St. Pete, from my house. And this is just a couple of airplanes that were uh, uh, transmitting loud enough and within range that my little receiver could pick them up. And, uh, and, and so this is super cool. And so you can turn your Raspberry Pi into an airplane tracking base station. And a lot of functionality you can get out of this stuff. Um, and so I mentioned it's my longest running Pi and project and things. So I'm currently running my uh, FlightAware, uh, PiAware base station here um, on a Pi 1, like the original Raspberry Pi. 
from years and years and years and years ago, flawlessly in my windowsill for the past, the current time, like not disconnecting it, three years straight. Uh, the only time it ever gets shut off is when the power goes out uh, or I bring it here. It has consistently survived everything in my windowsill uh, on the second floor um, to, to just listen to plane data. Uh, it's, it's so fun. And so let's talk about why I'm doing this in the first place and what, what you can do with it too and why, why it's cool and why it's interesting, right? And so first thing first is planes talk. Planes talk a lot. They, they, they communicate. And, and so uh, this project came out and it was called NextGen. Um, but it uses what we call ADSB, and this is the, the communication between planes. And obviously the ground too, we can hear it. Um, and what are planes saying? Right? They're talking a lot. They're talking about um, what's my identification, right? what's my tail? Right? And so our, our first one here is SWA 37. What airline is that? Southwest, Southwest Airlines, exactly. So Southwest Airlines Flight 37 is flying over my, my neighborhood. right? And it's squawking at 1442. That's some radio stuff, right? Okay. Um, its altitude is 12,800 and climbing. So we can see its uh, vertical velocity. Okay. Its speed in knots, 349 knots. It's hauling ass. Um, although it probably could go faster. It should be around 500. Uh, its distance from me is 11.2 nautical miles. So how far away it is from my geographical location. Um, because I, I have programmed it, like this is my GPS coordinates versus your GPS coordinates, okay? Um, heading, uh, you know, which way it's flying in, right? More velocity information. Messages, now messages is uh, all the messages I'm receiving, okay? So I've received 1,200 broadcasts from this plane during its flight duration in my vicinity, okay? And the age, that's just a second counter, right? So it's been eight seconds since I've received the last message. Right. So planes talk a lot. They're, they're saying all kinds of information. Um, and, and they're sharing it with each other. Right? And so why do we think that planes should be telling the world about themselves? A lot of planes in the air. Right? That's a reality. And so are you, you're calculating all this information just based on their chatter. It doesn't matter what they're saying. Correct. They chat on a very well-defined protocol, and therefore I can decode this and listen in to all of the plane chatter. That is correct. Uh, collision avoidance is, is a great example, right? And if a plane is aware of another plane, uh, that's a whole safety factor that we can add in here. Also, there's just simple awareness that a plane is out there, right? Uh, we've, we've heard of, you know, it's gone off the radar, right? Where did it go? Right, and so this is another way that planes can communicate with each other and the ground for safety and monitoring. Oh, yes, people with jetpacks. Oh, I'm at 800 feet and there's a guy with a jetpack here. And <laughs> I don't even want to know. Um, but anyway, so ADSB is cool. So FlightAware uh, is a website, and they put out the PiAware project. And, uh, and so all of the live data on FlightAware.com is actually coming from these base stations. Um, when you set up the flight of the Pyware software, um, it it uh, you can agree to share your findings back with FlightAware, and they uh, you know they combine all the data from all of the ground stations, and post it online. So there's there's you know theoretical data of where a plane may be, but then there's actual measurement data coming from all these different base points all over the globe. You know, uploading it simultaneously to get the most accurate plane location data for online sharing. It's really cool. And, and so uh, besides uploading it, your device, that web interface was running on the Raspberry Pi. And so I can also see live up-to-date information locally on my network alongside whatever I may be sharing out. Now, um, data from this is then measured and you get all kinds of cool metrics and scores and it's, it's fun and you can see on a map you know, where all the other base stations are. And I'll tell you, for the most part, America is pretty saturated. Most of the major countries are saturated. But you'll find people setting up these uh, ADSB receivers in very remote places um, simply to capture 
the ongoing uh, air traffic data overhead. And, um, and so uh, it, it's, just, it's really fun to be a part of this. I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, it doesn't take a lot to really get into it. Uh, and it's quite interesting. Um, when the, uh, oh, the last one I have to mention, of course, is that um, you get an enterprise account for also uploading and being part of the, like, the sharing community, um, which I use all the time, or used to, because I used to travel a lot, and I could look at where a plane was any time while I'm sitting at the airport waiting for that plane to arrive late at the gate. And so instead of talking to the person at the counter and going, so um, when is this plane arriving? Am I going to miss my next flight? I could simply go online, look up the inbound flight to my outbound flight, figure out where in the world it was, if it was flying around the cloud for, for you know, rain or something like that. Uh, so I, I found a lot of value out of having uh, that elevated uh, status account. So let's talk about the technology behind this and what's really going on behind the scenes. Uh, it's fairly simple, right? So ADSB operates on um, 1090 megahertz, and there's also a portion of this uh, in America that operates on 978 megahertz. And uh, and so what's happening is, is planes are communicating. We kind of cover that, and they're very chatty, and they talk a lot about who they are and where they're going and what speed they're going at and what altitude they're going at and where in the world they are, and, and, and then they, they squawk this, they're, they're constantly shooting this message out. And so the Pyware image um, is a pre-built image. You can get this directly from uh, FlightAware on their website, you download it, and you just you know, flash it to your little SD card, and boom, you're up and running and everything's good to go. You just have to configure a couple things about your account and what's your current GPS location, if you're interested in participating in MLAT. And that's just a, a multilateral. Uh, but the software, right, the, the, the real code behind this, and you can, you can do this entirely separate from, you know, FlightAware and Pyware. If you just want to see plane data and, uh, without any ties to anybody, Dump1090 is the suite. Dump1090 is the tool that um, interacts with your SDR, tunes it, brings the data in, and then runs that web service to, to plot all of that data on top of Google Maps. And so Dump1090 is, is the tool set that gets you all that wonderful commercial aviation uh, information. And then uh, Dump uh, 970 is uh, similar, but it does it for the uh, planes and devices that are operating on 970. Now, there's all kinds of laws around who's required to have ADSB and at, at what altitude. So commercial flights uh, and high altitude devices, uh, planes, Boeings, Airbus, stuff like that is going to have ADSB. Um, smaller, more um, hobbyist, uh, more personal flight doesn't necessarily need to have ADSB. And there, again, there, there's a lot of laws around that, and they may use 970 instead of 1090. And uh, FAA, somebody else's regulation, not mine. But as long as it exists, I want to listen to it. I want to pull it in, and I want to see what it's all about, right? And so um, uh, it, it, it's really cool stuff. And I, I have the FlightAware branded SDR. Again, they went out of their way to make a piece of hardware that's just using high-grade equipment um, and, and good microchips and good you know, components to give it the best, cleanest signal, not like the cheap ones that are made out of plastic, uh, similar to the expensive uh, metal in, in, uh, enclosure on the SDR, the RTLSDR.com version. Um, and so these are, these are really cool, too. And, and they're also just they're not expensive to get into this. And so what does it take to get started? Um, well, it takes a pie with a case. I mean, you really don't need a case. This, I have a case. Um, screen's optional, right? Uh, the, the, you could potentially put that web page on the screen, um, or you can just view that web page from another device, or you could just never view the web page because you're just constantly uploading and sharing the data and using the Pyware website. All right, uh, again, you need an SDR. So, so far we're at Pi and we're at SDR. Uh, and then we need an antenna. And this, compared to the previous project, you want to try to have something a little bit better tuned. And again, the stock antenna you can get by with. But um, a tuned antenna, more honed into that 1090 frequency, you'll find that uh, you'll, get, you'll receive more messages. And so to calculate how big of an antenna you need, uh, there's online tools, but the idea is um, taking the, the size of the wave, and you can have an antenna that's a quarter wavelength or a half wavelength, ultimately. Um, and that will just, again, help you kind of tune out some of that chatter and be able to get better 
messages received um, from the airplanes. Uh, and so uh, the other key thing here I mentioned, and I, I talked about this earlier, is I run out on the second floor in the window. You want a clear view of the sky. You want a clear view of where the planes are because they're going to be broadcasting and you are trying to receive this data. So either um, elevated is, is the main key. If you can run an antenna outdoors safely, you know, that's even better. Um, I know people that have installed like a very major 1090 tuned antenna on their roof at an ele super elevated height. And you can easily see planes from 200 to 300 miles away. I mean, it's, it's really impressive um, what you can see. Now, from my house, uh, with this, uh, here, I'll put it on camera, but this little rinky-dink antenna that I actually cut uh, to be a quarter wavelength uh, because the stock height was too much, I usually pick up easily 50 miles. Um, I can pick up some in the 100-mile range. And then rarely, every once in a while, I get one in the 150-mile range. But yeah, if I had a proper antenna and I set it up outside, um, I can easily see uh, traffic from Orlando uh, oh, flying overhead, which is a very busy airport, as, as you know. So um, very cool, very fun. Uh, this project has been around for a long time. As like I said, I'm running it on my original Pi 1. I, and this one's been powered on for three years straight in the window. Before I moved to my current location, I also ran it for another two years consistently there. So this is, this is a long time running thing for me and I really enjoy it. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, and so what's capable. And so to get yourself set up with this, now that you have your Pi and your SDR, a similar set of hardware as your previous build, um, you can install uh, your favorite Raspbian or Raspberry Pi OS uh, and then just install the, the tool set uh, to stack on top. Or you can, again, use the Pi Aware OS directly from um, FlightAware, uh, it's right on their website. And then uh, if you're interested in sharing the data, you, you claim your device on the website and you set up the authentication and where you're located and stuff like that and they'll put you on the map and boom, that's it. You're uploading and you're streaming. Um, and so, uh, so this right here is one of the devices and it's nothing really more than a screen on the Pi and that's just the website like that's running on the device. So you can like look at it locally in a browser or you can look at it on your computer. Um, so screen is entirely optional. It's not necessary uh, unless you want to make it maybe portable. Uh, one really cool thing uh, I've seen a lot of people do is they build these uh, devices, but they are a small aircraft pilot. So they build it so that it, they can bring it on their plane with them, especially if they don't have the very expensive avionics hardware to do this. Because uh, if you think cars and pimping out cars are expensive, planes are even more expensive. Uh, and so oftentimes, uh, small pilots uh, using their own planes that don't have fancy bells and whistles can build a portable Raspberry Pi with a screen like this just while they're flying so that they can see all of the data around them. Uh, and at altitude, your signal is great. So you can see for a long way away. Um, and, and the other thing too is you'll learn a lot about planes by the way they fly uh, and their flight patterns. For instance, like we have uh, highways on the ground, planes have highways in the sky and you can actually see that in the flight patterns and the directions of a lot of these you know, aircrafts that you can pick up. Um, one of the cool things I did with my uh, Pyware was uh, during the uh, start of some of the, um, the uh, uh, civil unrest uh, and protests is uh, uh, the police threw their whirly birds, their helicopters up, right? And they, those helicopters also broadcast ADSB. And so I was able to see the flight patterns of police helicopters in the areas over downtown uh, Tampa and over downtown St. Pete. Um, and it was very interesting because you can, you can tell when things were going on or if there was a police chase down the highway because you can see the helicopter traveling. I think I sent it yeah. to you guys. I was, like, I was like, oh, they're out tonight. You know, there's the police helicopters. And a little bit, a little bit of research, uh, you can figure out what the tail number of a police helicopter in the area is. And then you can simply uh, watch, it, uh, watch for it on your newly built device. 
Um, so that is uh, project number two. Now, I wanted to make another honorable mention. Uh, planes aren't the only things you can track. You can also track boats too. Uh, we are in a port city here in Tampa. Therefore, we see all kinds of great large vessels. Um, I originally called this uh, boats and something else, but I decided I'm on a boat was better. Um, so, uh, so oil tankers, right? Whether they're on fire or not, uh, you can track all kinds of cool stuff too. So I just wanted to mention this as like a side project, like maybe like a, like a bonus with, uh, with your plane tracking is why don't you take a look at where boats are also. So boats have their own software suites and they have their own capabilities and their own hardware. So this particular software, um, right, is called OpenCPN. And you'll find, uh, just like uh, pilots bring uh, ADSB devices on their planes if they don't have one built in, like the little power station, uh, pilots, or, or not pilots, captains will run OpenCPN on their boats uh, on a laptop, for instance, if they don't have fancy, expensive uh, boat navigation and boat tracking software. So. Super cool. You can do this from home if you're close enough to a waterway, right? Or a place that's going to have maritime traffic. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, it, it runs on a different system. So this one's called AIS, and that operates at 162 megahertz, right inside that cheap SDR range. And, um, and so uh, the ship tracking uh, can be done with uh, other additional specialized hardware or with your SDR. Uh, they just as much make an image for this. So RPI AIS uh, is a really cool focused built Raspberry Pi image, just like the one for Pi Aware that focuses on boats. And so uh, if this is your thing, uh, check it out. Uh, I didn't really get into it too much um, because I do the plain one too myself and I have a lot of experience with it. Um, but if this interests you at all, uh, be my guest. Uh, it is super cool. And again, boats are constantly talking. You can see all kinds of great information uh, about cruise ships and tankers uh, and just commercial uh, fleets and vessels. So interesting stuff. Uh, and, and the tool to do it all, right, is, is AIS um, Dispatcher. And that's what decodes the data, right? That's that software decoding all that data coming in from our uh, antennas. All right, we're going to move on to our third project. Um, now, the third project um, is about going global, right? And so far, we've talked about picking up things in very close proximity with our spectrum analyzer, right, and our frequency analyzer. And then we talked about things a little bit, you know, away from where we live, like the 200 rain, mile range with our uh, flight trackers and planes and boats and all those other vessels. Uh, let's take our let's take our radio and let's go global with it. Uh, and so let's jam out with our ham out and uh, this next project uh, does have components of it that would, you would need to be licensed, technically, uh, but it doesn't stop you from learning, OK? And so let's, let's get into this. Um, and so we'll talk about APRS. And I, I'll just jump, I'll say this first. I do not have a ham license. I do not broadcast, and I do not transmit because of that. Um, but uh, APRS is super cool. Um, for those that aren't ham nerds, I know, you know, uh, here at the Undercroft, there was recently a, a ham training, right, an examination. How many uh, ham licenses were awarded during that session? Three licenses. That's fantastic, right? I, I, I think having a ham license is super cool. It's something I've been meaning to do, um, but... Uh, but uh, it, it's really cool to see like community support for that. Um, that's just one of the you know many great things about Undercroft uh, that I love is is that that knowledge right and that training. So um, so APRS right. So this is digital real time communication through the airwaves. Okay, and what's going on here is is we're transmitting packets. Think like internet traffic, and internet plays a role in this too. That's how we end up global. But um, but initially, we're talking about sharing tactical information, right, and messages. Um, what the hell do we mean by tactical? Well, what about uh, GPS of a moving object, like a vehicle? Uh, or maybe even just something as simple as somebody hiking in the woods, right? And you have a, 
an APRS transmitter on your backpack. Okay, and we'll get to why any of this is useful, but work with me here. Um, weather station telemetry. This is a really cool one. So if you're if you're monitoring for signals and you want to share your findings, right? Over here, it's this temperature and this humidity, and over here, it's different. So we we have all these measurement points, right? Great data out there. Right? Short messages. Think uh, like SMS for hands, right? I can I can send you a, a text message, a little short message. And, uh, and it's actually gone to a whole other level. Apparently, you can email and, and mail and deliver and fax things these days, too, with, uh, with APRS. And just look it up. Hams and APRS people are, are fantastic. Um, now, fun fact, it actually was originally called the Automated uh, Position Reporting System back in the 80s when it was initially put together. In fact, APR uh, comes from uh, the three last digits of the developer's ham uh, call sign. So uh, it just so happens that automated packet reporting uh, works. Uh, it was made after. So APR came first, then the name. So, uh, so let's talk about this. Uh, one of the cool things you can build with your Raspberry Pi, again, we're staying Pi focused here, is, is these what we call eye gates and digipeters. And right, what the hell is an eye gate and a digipeter? Uh, and well, ultimately, it's your base station, right? And there is dedicated hardware on the market for this kind of stuff, but you can do it with a Raspberry Pi. And so the Digipeter listens for radio packets that come in, it receives them, and then it repeats them. Well, that's useful, because signal repeaters really help when you're trying to get a message a long way away, uh, and you can't get there with your own broadcast power. right? And so repeaters are necessary. And Again, hams will understand this, but, but repeaters are part of the ecosystem when you're sending uh, you know, signals very far, especially over a horizon, okay? uh, except for the flat earthers. Then it, it goes all the way, every time. Um, so, so, so a digipeter is a digital repeater. right? It's, it's the pie take on, on how we're going to get involved in this. And then there's eye gates. So these eye gates are super cool, too. And what they do is they'll listen for these radio packets, just like our Digipeter initially does. But the eye gate forwards them over the internet. So it captures it and puts it over the internet for everybody else. Okay. Now, these eye gates, they can send packets to the proper recipient. So maybe they need to be rebroadcasted somewhere else in the world. So if I dump it over the internet and then everybody else rebroadcasts it, hopefully the person that's destined for will hear it, will capture it, will listen. Right? <coughs> and so it's uploaded online through awesome services like APRS.fi. Which, by the way, you can totally go to that website right now and look at where all the APRS eye gates are and all of the devices that are broadcasting APRS and that are being picked up by the eye gates and the digipeters. And so you can see the entire network of hardware and people involved in this, this awesome communication system. Now, I mentioned packets can also come from the internet to be transmitted on your Digipeter base station for your local area back on the airway. So we're gatewaying from radio to internet back to radio, right? all done through a Raspberry Pi. Okay? Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up here. I know, uh, I don't know if the online Folks, can, can they see this? OK, so this is APRS.fi right now. Um, and we are honed in. Uh, what, what, where are we looking here? Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's us here in Tampa, Tampa Bay. And so you can click on any of these devices to see what it is uh, and a little bit of information about it. There's weather stations out there that are broadcasting APRS data that is being received by uh, an eye gate and then sh shared online. There are uh, vehicles moving that are broadcasting their GPS location that's being picked up by an eye gate uh, or a digipeter and then shared online. And so this is really cool network of communications uh, that can all be done with a Raspberry Pi and an SDR. So fun stuff, right? So you can play passively um, by simply listening to what's going on around you and, and taking your part in uploading that to, to the internet 
uh, to help that message get to maybe where it's going, right? And again, uh, there's, there's a whole other aspect of this that I haven't really delved into because I don't have a ham license, but messages are destined and they're like packets on the internet and the internet is used as a gateway, as an intermediary to reach a farther distance and all kinds of fun stuff. But, um, but this is for the ham people. Do look it up, do check it out uh, because you can definitely get involved um, by, help, by receiving information, okay? And so uh, the assembly is a combination of really cool stuff. You have your Raspberry Pi, uh, but you also have a transmitting device if you want to repeat, right? If you want to be a digipeater. And so we take our Pi and we take uh, an SDR if we just want to receive, or we take an SDR in combination with a transmitter, or we just use a transmitter alone because technically this thing can send and receive at the same time. You know, it's, it's one device that does receiving and transmitting, right? So uh, there's a multitude of ways you can take it on, but there's a great software suite um, that goes with this, right? And so that software suite um, is called Direwolf. And so you get this installed, and the idea is that all of these different APRS signals that are happening in the air from all these different transmitting devices you can pick them up and you can receive them, and then you can then share them back online, or you can do your part in retransmitting messages. And again, I probably got a couple errors somewhere along the way in this part because, again, I don't have my hand license. But I find this absolutely fascinating. There's an entire communication network in radio that uses the internet to go global, and it can all be achieved with a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and that's, that's your way in, like that's your key to be a participant. Um, and, and it's just so cool. And so uh, if you are interested in this, do get your ham license and look it up. So again, it's called APRS. Um, and so that kind of rounds out my three projects that you today can go home and do for very cheap, right? I'm talking under $100 in, in parts to do all of this. Uh, and you can have just a lot of fun, right? And you can learn all kinds of new things. And you can experiment. And you can really just get to see what's out there, right? Now, SDR, again, is a whole topic of its own, right? What is capable uh, when you get into radio and when you can get into those kinds of tools, right? But I wanted to focus on what we can do with a Pi and some simple things that can really help us maybe step into that next level of learning. Now, what would I be without showing you some other cool, fun little things you can do? Um, there's a lot more. Remember that list? Let's highlight some of those. First one, weather data. Uh, NOAA, or Meteor for the Russians, for the Ruskies, um, these satellites are constantly floating overhead in geospatial orbit. And at the right time of day, on the right day, you can run outside and you can take your purpose-built 3D printed exactly 53.4 centimeter long antennas at 21 uh, degrees and stick this somewhere and you basically have to set it horizontal like this facing south like this. so the 3d printed thing says point this middle part south and it tells you the measurement each one of these arms need to be and then it tells you the the angle right and so at at 21 inches long, at 120 degree angle, at, or 53 centimeters for you Europeans, facing south horizontally, you too <laughs> can, at the right time of day, <laughs> uh, pick up um, satellite imagery, like live satellite imagery being broadcast and beamed back down to Earth from a NOAA satellite of weather. I mean, if you ask me, it's kind of out of this world. So, uh, <laughs> And that was actually one of our questions. What was the purpose of the blue plastic triangle between the antennas on the table? Yeah, okay. thank you for asking. So I'll come a little bit closer. But, but basically, there, this is a 3D printed jig for what we call a dipole antenna. And, uh, I, and it highlights, the, it has the, the pre-configured arc. Um, and then it uh, tells you the length um, and then the direction for south. And so it's kind of like a, a helpful template to be able to, uh, to pick up 
this weather data. And so you can get this on Thingiverse. Um, and so I printed one out um, with the hopes that one day I will be in the right place at the right time uh, because <laughs> it could be 3 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday <laughs> that, uh, um, that they, one of these satellites that's, that's broadcasting flies overhead. And there's great software out there um, that will help you, right? So this, this Orbitron is one of the tools on the, on the left that um, just helps you find where satellites are. And so you can focus in on NOAA 8 and NOAA 9, uh, which are the ones you don't normally listen to. Um, but similarly, Meteor 2 is a great weather satellite uh, from Russia that also broadcasts down the images. And so you can use um, some, some software with your SDR to uh, receive this stuff. And it, does, it takes a while for the picture to come in and a couple minutes and then it will process the data. But you ultimately end up with some beautiful photos from space uh, that were taken at that moment in time. Uh, it's really cool. And so a uh, really fun project. Uh, uh, so check it out. Uh, great stuff online about that. Uh, I mentioned this one earlier, International Space Station. So the Russian module on the International Space Station has been broadcasting a picture over what's called slow scan television um, for years, for a long time. And they do change the picture, everyone. They do change it regularly. <laughs> and and um, so something years. cool here is there's a website called Space Flight Software. And you're encouraged if you pick up um, the photo being broadcasted at the time that the space station's over your head, you're encouraged to go and upload what you received. And so spaceflightsoftware.com um, has is a beautiful library of these images received um, from different people. I mean, all over the world are going outside to pick up space station broadcasts. Uh, really fun. Uh, cool stuff that you can do. Uh, this one was picked up more recently. They have, um, and you can see it's in Russian. Um, they have another one that has like pictures of like helicopters. Like I, I don't know what they're doing, but I think they're demonstrating their military prowess because the rest of the photos that they put that aren't a space station are just like planes and helicopters, but like badass planes and helicopters. So it's really cool. Um, check it out. Uh, it's a lot of fun to uh, also talk, uh, or at least listen to the space station when you get an opportunity. So it's another one for you. So next uh, fun little thing you can do with an SDR, and again, all this stuff is really great, especially if you have kids, love this, right? Uh, it's called radio signs, and we don't really call them radio signs in America. Uh, it's more of an international term. Uh, I didn't really know what one is until more recently in life, uh, when I got into like um, drones and stuff like that, and, but, uh, but radio suns, also known as weather balloons, should have just called it that, um, a, uh, they, they transmit all of their active findings back down um, during their entire flight. And so uh, um, a weather balloon will go up and it will say, you know, altitude, temperature, humidity, all the measuring factors during this weather balloon's flight. And then ultimately that weather balloon will pop and fall back to Earth, and it needs to say, like, hey, I'm over here, come collect me. And so they'll be constantly broadcasting. And so there's, um, there's people online that will, like, be, like, they'll go on hunting adventures for radio signs, and they will, like, uh, they'll, they'll set up their devices, and they'll, they'll, they'll find them and hone in on signal strength. And radio signs often, when you find them, have, like, how to send me home instructions on them. Like, I belong to this research lab. Here's my address and phone number. Like, if you find me, please call this number and we'll, you know, we'll come retrieve it from you or you can mail it back to us, right? Uh, because these research balloons are very important. In fact, uh, uh, balloons are, I believe, sent out twice a day in most of the research spots. So this picture comes from Boulder, Colorado. And, uh, and so it will fly up, do all of its collections, pop, and then fall back to Earth um, softly. And as you can see from the software, it travels quite a bit, so they got to go and get it. And the only way to know where it is is if it's broadcasting and it's screaming in the airwaves, right? And so super cool, fun stuff. Um, if you ever want to do like uh, halves or high altitude balloons and things like that that measure 
or if you ever want to like send up a GoPro to see the curvature of the earth to prove all the flat earth is wrong, you have to still broadcast so that you know where your device is um, because the winds are going to carry it, right? So these are fun, um, really cool stuff to look up. I wouldn't suggest going and hunting radio signs because uh, all you're going to do is find something that you have to give back. You're not supposed to keep it. <laughs> so anyways, research purposes only, uh, but super fun. I think that's interesting. Uh, and then finally, good old FM. But there's more, right? FM isn't just FM radio. First off, hey, what does FM mean? Frequency modulation, frequency modulation. exactly. Uh, and so frequency modulation, uh, or what we like to call music that we listen to, um, is a lot more than it used to be, right, when it was first being done. So today we have stuff like RDS. And so RDS is the radio data system. Uh, have you ever been in your car and your radio knew the name of the song, the artist of the song, the album of the song, the genre of the music, and what station you were listening to by call sign, not by frequency number? It's called RDS. And so small bits of data are being transmitted alongside your FM music. Uh, and so you can pick up RDS data and read this. And you can also, with the little porta pack, broadcast RDS data um, and, and do some kind of testing and experimentation with that. And so, our, so that's just one uh, step up from, from you know, doing this with, with software defined radios. But the next one is HD radio. And HD radio is really interesting. And I put a lot of information about it. But to, to, to really simplify it, HD radio is completely different than like standard FM, frequency modulated wide audio, right? And what it is, is HD radio is entirely digital. This is, this is crazy stuff. It actually um, was developed to um, like kind of overlap or run with FM radio so that a radio station has the capability of transmitting legacy FM and HD radio at the same time. And they can actually like put more effort into one or the other for that same uh, you know, frequency range. Um, and so this results in what we call an in-band on channel. Um, and so they're both existing there. Um, and so it, it's like a hybrid of, of digital data that's through an AC, AC codec that has to do all this crazy stuff um, versus just listening to the frequency modulation that we all know and love. So uh, there is more that you can do with the radio with your SDR than just listening to music. There, there is data out there uh, that you are capable of playing with and learning about. So experiment away. Um, so. I know we're like an hour and a half into this, and we went over all these cool projects. First off, are there any questions before I go on to the next section? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we've got uh, a couple here. So um, from RJ45, uh, what's the reason for eight plus antennas on the Wi-Fi routers and the new Hack5 Pineapple? <laughs> so the reason for multiple antennas on a device is because um, each one of those antennas can only be fixed to a particular frequency at a time. And so to be able to be, first off, Wi-Fi isn't just one channel. Like 802.11b is 11 channels. Right. Uh, but you can only exist on one channel at a time. And so having multiple antennas allows you to do what we call MIMO, multi-input, multi-output, uh, and multi-channel capabilities. So, it, it's not just to look fancy. It gives you multiple channel support at the same time. So there is a benefit to it, uh, but it also kind of looks cool. So hope that answers your question. Um, from uh, Excrucio, what do you think of the Mayhem firmware on the Porta Pack? So the question is, what do I think of the Mayhem firmware? I love it. So when I first got it, Porta Pack firmware is the base uh, firmware that you can get. And it's open source. And then the, the before Mayhem was called Havoc. And so Havoc was around for a long time. And the Havoc is what really took the Porta Pack and turned it into like the hacker's dream tool um, because it added a ton of functionality um, to the Porta Pack. Uh, but May so Havoc has actually, the, the open source project has since uh, discontinued. And so Mayhem is actually the only thing right now that exists 
for the Porta Pack uh, with continued development and support. Uh, so I wouldn't just suggest it because of its feature set, uh, but I also suggest it because it's current. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Um, the metal enclosures are recommended for the SDRs over plastic? Um, so the metal enclosures are in a radio, um, there, there's an actual purpose for it um, because uh, the metal enclosure will def deflect uh, noise interference. Uh, and there's, again, there's a very deep, um, you know, radio theory that can go around it. But generally, when something is enclosed by metal, it's protecting it from uh, interference. And so that means you'll get a cleaner signal. Um, and so the, the plastic ones, uh, why I mentioned that the metal SD, uh, RTLSDR.com version is better is because it's enclosed in metal. Therefore, it doesn't get as much interference. And also, the components inside are much more sensitive. Uh, to that interference, so you have to shield them, kind of like a Faraday shield, right? Um, when we're talking about any kind of radio device, you've probably heard like a Faraday cage. If you put a cell phone or a laptop in it, radio signal gone, right? And so we want to, we want to, uh, you know, keep our signal as clean as possible to process it. Um, can you get? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mark. Oh my God. And the power. Power noise interference is terrible too. And so having that case grounded, it, it neutralizes a lot of that. So very good point. Uh, can you get an adapter that allows you to connect SDR to a traditional coax? So an SDR being software defined is, is a USB uh, component only. And so uh, on the other end though, if you're talking about the antenna end, yes, you can convert the antenna end to all the different adapters. but. When it comes to an SDR, it's a software defined radio. Therefore, there has to be a software component controlling the radio device. It has to tell it what to tune to. Um, so, so they will always be computer dependent in some form or fashion because we've abstracted all of that filtering hardware back to the software. But if you want to connect uh, arbitrary antennas, um, most of my SDRs use an SMA connector. But if you have antennas that are BNC, or coax, or, or a variety of other um, copper core based uh, cables, um, absolutely, there's an adapter for everything. So uh, don't think that there's a limitation on hooking up your SDR to any particular type of antenna based off the connector. You can either purchase it or make it yourself with a crimper. Cool. So. All right. We're all good. Thank you online. I do appreciate your, uh, your questions. Keep them coming. So uh, let's talk about the important questions, not yours, but these. Uh, the more you know, and we'll keep you out of trouble too. All right. And I've talked about a couple things that maybe require a license. We've also covered that transmitting is a no-no. Right. And so let's get into this. Right. Do I need a ham license? Well, no. The first two projects were entirely passive. I don't have a ham license. I'm not doing anything illegal. Um, it's in the air, right? It's already out there, so you can listen. Again, if you're sitting in a coffee shop and somebody says their credit card number or social security number really loudly, that's not your problem for hearing it. Now, if they broadcast it and you pick it up over your Wi-Fi in promiscuous mode, a little questionable, but similar concept. They said it, unencrypted. So um, it's in the air. Uh, now, there are some caveats, right? It's not, it's not as simple as no, but we're just going to say no the star asterisk law, and we'll get into that in a second. Now, yes, yes, if you want to broadcast, right, and you want to participate, and you want to do stuff like APRS, right, and you think those messages are cool, and you want to get a call sign, um, you know, a lot, again, a lot of the, the executive team and founders and, and members here are getting into ham, so I, I encourage it. I think it's wonderful. Uh, and so, yes, right, and those different licenses will get you different capabilities. Um, plus, it's fun. You know, get in and explore. What's up? Yeah, and so, so the question was, is, is, this, is still having a ham license is to a specific frequency? And y yes, right? You're not, you can't go willy-nilly all over the place. You can't set up a, a radio station, right? Not going to happen. Because one, the frequency is already registered with the FCC. And two, your broadcast power strength is you're not allowed to broadcast that strong, right? Um, you know, radio stations are in, in the hundreds of watts. They're broadcasting for hundreds of miles. You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> so... Um, 
So yes, different levels for broader frequencies and strengths, right? But again, it's, it's a very well-defined space too. So yes, uh, it's, it's not just do whatever you want. Um, but learn about it, have fun, explore. Uh, there's plenty of information online to help you determine if that's something you want to get into. Um, let's talk about the laws. This is the law that screws you every time you want to listen. This is the only thing that, that really makes listening bad. Um, and so the Electronic Communication Privacy Act of 1986, which has been amended by our favorite Patriot Act, I want to say favorite, but, uh, but has been regularly updated uh, to comply with additional things. Uh, U.S. Code, uh, or 18 U.S. Code, Section 2510, Definition, Subsection 16, whatever, right? Point is, is D, underlined here, says something very specific. Transmitted over a communication system provided by a common carrier, air, um, unless the communication is a tone only paging system, right? And that's like beep, boop, beep, boop, right? So basically this is saying that you are not allowed to listen to a communication system over a common carrier where defined by this fancy use. And what the hell does all this mean, right? This is just one little sentence. What it means is you can't deal with encrypted data or special data right, or, or encoded data, because it's meant to be hidden from you. And like pagers, we talked about pagers, right? Um, commercial pager data, POXAG, FLEX, hospital data. What do you think a hospital is transmitting over their encoded pager network? Medical records. Medical records, PII, PHI, stop. <laughs> now, how do we fix that. Well, in a computer cybersecurity world, we would improve encryption, right? We would use very, very strong ciphers. We would uh, establish a protocol or a means that was proprietary. No, no, we don't want to change the way things work. We just want to make a law that makes it illegal. So don't go decoding your hospital pager duty. Anyways, don't do it. So, I mean, it, <laughs> I think it's pretty self explanatory, but a cyber agent. 47, question, is it illegal to listen to the police transmissions in real time, and can the pie with one of the uh, attachables be configured? Okay, so to repeat your question, can you listen to police stuff? This is a great question, and the answer is yes. And so there's, there, there's two caveats to this, though. It's, it's a yes and it's a no. Um, yes, if it's unencrypted, that means it's broadcasted. So, so I do listen to police data, uh, uh, fire, ambulance, like that's all over. In fact, you can actually listen to this online. So if you've ever heard of the term a police scanner, that is, ex it's exactly what you're talking about, is it's a purpose-built piece of hardware to listen to police chatter. Now you can do it with an SDR, very simple. You can also do it online for free because people record with an SDR wherever in the world they are and then broadcast it over the internet as a live audio stream. Now, you can't listen to police data if it's encrypted. And what that means is that there's a, a chip or a configuration in the police radio hardware that only allows them to talk to each other. Um, and so it's not that you can't by law. I mean, you're not supposed to decrypt it, but it, there's also a level of difficulty that you simply can't get past, which is um, the encrypted traffic. Now, obviously enough money and time and anything, uh, it'll get pwned. But uh, generally, um, only unencrypted police chatter um, is uh, easy to pick up. And, but you absolutely can listen. There's nothing stopping you from picking up public service radio. So hopefully that answers your yeah. question. And then one more, if you don't mind. So from sure. Philly Tech Club, uh, where does L-O-R-A fit in? LoRaWAN. So LoRaWAN, um, which is the question, what, what, is, where, where does that fit into all this? It fits in similarly to um, what I'm talking about here at the bottom. And so uh, to, this will actually, this slide answers your question. And so let me go through it and then I'll highlight your, your specific thing. So again, let's not decrypt intentionally encrypted data. Let's not decode intentionally encoded data. We're not going to fix the system. We're just going to make it illegal, right? Because if you can't, if, if it ain't broken yet, we're going to break it even more. So now, 
Um, transmitting without a license, I mentioned this, right? And again, you know, where and when and how and stuff like that is part of your, your license structure. Um, but things you cannot do. Pirate radio, do not do that. You are capable of doing it, doesn't mean you should do it. Emergency services, don't mess with the emergency services. Seriously, there's somebody's life at stake. It's just not worth it, okay? Airplanes, we talked about how we can receive a lot of that chatter. It, you are capable of broadcasting your own ADSB information and pretending to be a fake airplane. There was a lot of research around this. Uh, it was uh, very controversial at DEF CON. The, uh, a lot of different federal agencies showed up to a particular fly a plane sideways talk. Yeah, I remember that. Um, just don't mess with airplanes. Uh, the, the onboard uh, systems could uh, potentially do all kinds of evasive, evasive auto flight maneuvers if a plane is detected too close and you can injure and kill individuals. Uh, it's also extremely illegal. Um, the port of pack can broadcast ADSB. Okay, so uh, now those exceptions, right? Where, where does all the, the normal things we do when it comes to broadcasting? Well, our laptop broadcasts, right? It's a receive and transmit process. Bluetooth, right? Um, little things. So, so where are our exceptions? Super low power, close range, right? You're allowed to do these things. Um, you're allowed to use an FM transmitter in your car. For instance, it can take a, an adapt to your cell phone and it broadcasts on a very, 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 very low power FM frequency that's about the bubble of your car so that you can play the music. These were very popular uh, about a decade ago, okay? Um, and then all of the other you know, normal stuff, right? So Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, this includes LoRaWAN, ZigBee, Z-Wave, right? All those, those um, uh, you know, small wireless intercommunication protocols, right? And so obviously you don't need a license to do that. Uh, we call it the 2.4 gigahertz, like open use spectrum, you know, whatever. So, um, so that's, that's really the only time you get to transmit stuff uh, legally. So, all right. That covers the legal stuff. Yes. Good. I hope that, I, I knew it would answer it. That was good. Um, all right, so just one more time, don't do it. That's it, just wanna leave it at that. We're not gonna talk about it again. Do not do it. Um, and, and, and I mean this, don't be that person because you're gonna screw it up for the rest of us. <laughs> it goes to you, internet. Don't be that person. Um, don't be this guy. So <laughs> this was an art installation in New York City that was set up, and those are th three pagers receiving pager data from the various area hospitals and services and then printing out every single message it received. Oh my God. That paper contained all kinds of delicate information. This was an art installation. It was also illegal. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you can look it up. It's called the Holy Pager. Uh, there's, there's some cool stuff online. You can look uh, about it. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't replicate it, but, uh, but it was kind of interesting to read about. So uh, they, they captured this. And it... Anyways, don't do that. All right, uh, let me send you home with some great stuff. You too can learn uh, some of my favorite YouTube channels that I watch to learn about this. Um, Andreas Spies, guy is brilliant. He, uh, I think I mentioned him about some Raspberry Pi stuff earlier, but he go, he's really big on LoRaWAN. So if you're interested in LoRaWAN, Andreas, a uh, great YouTube channel, awesome hobbyist, really fun videos, and he, t he approaches all of his videos like he's teaching in a classroom. And his, his favorite saying is, you know, you want to sit in the, fir the front row, the first row. He's very big on just information and learning. So great, great, great YouTube channel. TechMinds is another one. They have so much SDR stuff. They have all the different hardware and all the tools, and they have, they have tutorials on how to build a porta pack and how to flash it and how to use it and set it up, and just it's so much cool stuff. If you want to really just get some great hands-on instructional um, to, to really extend to this. And then, and then there's great channels out there like Modern Ham, right? Just enthusiasts sharing what they're learning about uh, when they're messing with SDR and when they're, they're experimenting and they're learning and all the software and all the hardware. And so, so these are some great uh, YouTube channels, uh, along with the Undercroft YouTube channel, uh, that you can subscribe to and, and, and check out to learn more about um, some of the things that we talked about today. Um, and so that really rounds it out. We're, we're hitting the last 10 minutes of our two hour block. I really do like to go for those two hours. So let's take these 10 minutes here uh, and, and see if there's any additional questions 
uh, from the online viewers, um, you know, and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, we, well, we've got um, so sure. Wooden. Um, can you ask John to tune in to four four six point zero 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 seventy cm calling channel? <laughs> We will do that okay. right after the broadcast when we get our hands sure. on the hardware. And then um, from Shizzle, best SDR for capturing the signals from news cars or newer cars. What is the best SDR capturing? The so signals when we're talking about newer, newer cars, cars, there's a lot. So here's the thing, right? A modern vehicle, let's say a brand new 2020 car, has a ton of radios in it. And when I mean radios, I'm not just talking the one you listen to music on. So the first system a uh, car broadcast is called a TPMS, or Tire Pressure Monitoring System. The um, port pack can read the radio coming from your tire, from your wheel, that's transmitting its pressure and temperature. And RTL 433? Uh, I believe it's 315. Well, uh, it doesn't have 433 can decode it. Oh, yeah, RTL 433. Yeah, yeah but about, I think it's 315 megahertz is the frequency at which the uh, TPMS system operates. Uh, the second radio your car has is Bluetooth, so that's 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, modern cars now also have hotspots in them, so we're talking about both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Um, and then there's the variety of other um, potential radio devices. Now, if there's something more specific, I maybe could chime in. Um, but, uh, oh, and then you're talking about unlocks. Of course, you want to steal a car. Great. <laughs> so to uh, unlock a car, um, now uh, there's it, it, some cars yes, some cars no. And so uh, modern uh, lock and unlock uh, technology uses uh, frequency hopping and uses a bunch of different uh, techniques to make it difficult to clone or uh, emulate. Um, the port pack supports a couple of manufacturers built in to do um, uh, signal capture and signal replay. Um, it's similar to modern garages. Uh, garages back in the day used to be dip switch based. Uh, therefore, you could just tune to the exact frequency and then pulse the signal. Now, again, they're using frequency hopping uh, and all kinds of other uh, uh, initiatives and technologies to avoid uh, theft and cloning. Um, and, uh, but uh, I encourage you to research this stuff uh, because we're getting to a borderline of ethicalness. Um, yes, it's capable. Yes, it's possible. Um, uh, but uh, I, I, I don't want to encourage it. Uh, unless it's for research purposes only. Um, not really a question, but a comment from SWFL SEC um, about oh, hey, the Mike. weather balloons. Um, yeah. A father and daughter launched their own balloon a couple years ago in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, I think they have a blog for it. A farmer found it months later after they had ended their search. Mike, that's a wonderful story that you had an opportunity to launch a weather balloon uh, <laughs> with your daughter in, in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, and yeah, and that's the thing, is, is you put the, uh, your contact info on the weather balloon's uh, main device. And even though it may have been lost, like you said, for months, um, somebody found it. Uh, and, that, and that's super cool. And that's what a lot of these research balloons and radio songs are doing, is, uh, is they're, they're constantly you know, being sent up uh, with the expectation of being recovered. Uh, but at least during their flight, they're, they are broadcasting uh, all of that, the metric data. So. Uh, but very cool. Uh, not, not a lot of people get the opportunity to launch a, um, a high altitude balloon, um, especially if you're near a, a dense area, whether it could land in traffic or in airport uh, planes and stuff. Uh, so it sounds like Michigan was a, was a great place to, uh, to send it out over some fields. Yeah. Um, that's looking like that's it. Well, RJ's typing, so he might RJ's have. Yeah, he might have one more. Well, we'll let that last meme. one come in. Yeah, um, it's probably a meme. Uh, we'll see. It might be a meme. Uh, well, three to one that it's a meme. Any takers? Um, with that, again, we've talked about some really fun hardware today. Uh, I encourage everybody to go out and take your Raspberry Pis that you may already have, and pair it with a software-defined radio, something like one of these entry-level uh, devices. Uh, from rtl-sdr.com. Um, not really pimping them, I just love their hardware. And, um, and they have a ton of, of uh, blog posts, articles, and how-tos. You can really get help uh, get started on some of this stuff. Um, I'll make sure to have these slides uh, sent over to the Undercroft crew. So we'll be uh, posted online for everybody to review. Um, and outside of that, I've had a wonderful time uh, researching and preparing this presentation and talk over the past couple weeks. Uh, I can't wait for my next opportunity. Um, with that, I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight, watching online. Um, hope you have a safe and uh, wonderful evening uh, surfing those airwaves and staying out of trouble. Thank cool. you. Thanks, John. Woo!